Hey, yo, look, I got a major lick for us. It's a Mexican dude. He got about 60 bands in the house. I know exactly where it's at. Let's go get this money. Hold up, are you crazy? I'm not trying to go in nobody's house and rob him. If he got 60 bands, you best believe he got some protection in there with him. That's the thing. No, I be over it all the time. He don't even fool with no guns. Plus, I know the certain times he's going to be there and not be there. We can go in and be out within two or three minutes and have the money. You know, I'm not... I'm not with hurting nobody. So if it's something we gonna do, we got to go in when he's not there. Can you rest assured he's not gonna be there? Cause I'm not trying to hurt nobody. Oh man, what happened, man? This was not supposed to happen. What happened? You said he wasn't gonna be there. We go in the house and the dude is firing at us with the gun, man. Now he's unalive. You said nobody was gonna get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, it's on. Back at you one more again, Real Kids TV in the house like kitchen sinks. Before I even get into uh, today's uh, storyline, if you will, I just want to let you all know I am disgusted. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, have been for over 30 years. At this point, I'm just, it's an embarrassment. I'm disgusted. Jerry Jones, Stephen Jones, the grandkids, the great great grandkids the great 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 grandkids to be i'm just disgusted man not even competitive at this point you're gonna lose from time to time in the nfl i get it but they're not even putting a competitive product out there on the field merely 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 disappointed and disgusted now before i get into today's actual story understand that i'm the self-proclaimed mr 30 minutes or better meaning that anytime i drop a story it's guaranteed to be 30 minutes or better. So if you're on your way to work, you're at work, you don't feel like being there, your boss is getting on your nerves, you're on your way home from work, you need to laugh, you need to cry, perhaps you need to lay down and take a nap, or you're trying to go to sleep depending on whatever time you're viewing this video at night. Perhaps you're just in the mood to hear a good old-fashioned true keyword, true penitentiary slash life experience slash life story. This is the channel for you. You like your 8, 10, 15 minute videos? Absolutely nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But at Real Kings TV, it's 30 minutes or better. So with all that being said, to wrap all of that uh, 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 monologue, if you will, all into one big nutshell, pause, there is a message. You know, out of all the years that I've done in prison, I only cried one time. And I've shared with you all uh, in a previous video how that came about. Now, the situation in which I cried, um, now you feel like crying all the time. But initially, when I went to prison, my daughter was a little over two, two years old. And it was a good 10 months before I had an opportunity to see her. Because when you first go to prison, they send you to the Rotary Farmers where you get processed and then classify and they send you wherever you're going to be housed at. And so I ended up being sent like two and a half hours away. And I was kind of like up in the, you know, like way, way out of the way. I didn't want anybody to drive up there and come and see me. So it took me about 10 months to get close to home. I hadn't seen my daughter the entire time. So at this point, she's three years old. My mother brings her, to, actually her mother brings her to see me. And she comes to me, but she starts to cry. But she's coming to me and she's hugging me and she's holding on tight. We're in the visitation room. Y'all rock with me, man. Let me know where you're chiming in from. I'm in Lexington, Kentucky. And so she comes to me and the more that she visits on the weekends, the more comfortable that she is around me. I was always there for my daughter from day one until, you know, I became uh, or I got myself incarcerated. Once the mother, you know, her mother and I, we kind of went our separate ways, to say the least. Then my mother started to bring my daughter. So I never really lost that, you know, that, that actual contact with her, although I was incarcerated. I would say at this point, she's maybe, she's still three. She's not quite four yet. Well, she may have just turned four. I don't remember exactly how old she was. But I know that we was at the visitation room. And 
it was time for visit to end. She's playing. We they have like the little toys laid out and things like that. So the kids come and visit. You know they can get candy and you know uh, drinks and things out of the machine. And they have toys and you know little uh, coloring books and you know things to keep their mind you know occupied or what have you. And it was time for her to leave. She was like, "Come on, Daddy." Come on, Daddy, it's time to go. And I had to explain to her, Daddy can't go right now. And I'll be home, but I can't go right now. But why, Daddy? I want you to come with us. I want you to come with, you know, me and Granny. That's what she calls my mother, Granny. I'm like, I can't go right now, baby girl, but she don't understand it. She's just a little kid. She gets to crying. And my mom's trying to carry her off. And she's like, no, no, I want my daddy. I want my daddy. Please, daddy, come with us. Please, please, please. And that was the one time that I just couldn't hold back and I shed a tear in prison. Out of all the years that I've served, out of all the times that the judge, I feel as though I was blatantly over-sentenced. That's the one time that made me shed a tear in, in prison, man. It made me understand the disappointment that I've caused my loved ones. And so I'm in prison one night. It's probably, I don't know. It had to have been maybe two thirty, three 3 o'clock in the morning. And I wake up and when I wake up, I hear like this, you know, that sound of somebody crying, like, you know, you can tell when an individual is, is crying. So I roll over. I see my bunkie. Bunkie was a young dude. At the time, he was probably 24, 25 years old. And I'm like, bro, you, bro, what's, what's going on? You all right? What's, you know, what's, what's up with you? He was like, man, I ain't never going home. You never going home? I mean, what, what, you know, I know that he had a, a significant amount of time. So I'm like, what, what's, what's the problem, man? Like, I mean, I understand, you know, the, the time is getting to you. Like, you know, talk to me, man. Like, you know, I really try to, I really try to help him out. Um, because the reality was he wasn't going home for a long time. If he, he had some health issues, so if he even made it out, it was going to be many years before so. We're just going to call him Dave, Big Dave. Big Dave gets to telling me the, you know, intricacies of his case, the ins and outs or whatever. He needed a listening ear. He didn't need a, I told you so, and that's what you get, and you youngsters out there, and y'all want to play with these guns and this and that on the streets. At this particular moment, he just needed a listening ear. Big Dave and four of his friends decided they wanted to commit a robbery. Now, this wasn't Big Dave's idea. It was brought to him, but nevertheless, he partook in the situation, in the robbery. We had two females three dudes one of the females she was acquainted with a mexican the mexican had big work he kept big money kept you know a lot of drugs weed and things of that nature and she had frequent frequented his home several times so she knew kind of where everything was at she swore up and down that the mexican didn't have a gun she swore up and down that the mexican was not even going to be home. She brings the plan to, you know, her little crew or whatever. Initially, Big Dave was like, nah, man, I'm not with that, man. I'm not trying to rob nobody. Big Dave didn't have a criminal record. Never even had a, a traffic ticket. I don't even think Big Dave drove. A couple more weeks went past. Big Dave is thinking about all this money that she said that he has in the house. So you said dude got 60000 and I seen it, and you seen it. 
Man, he got 60000 He probably got more than that, but I know he definitely has 60000 in the house. So they start to formulate a plan. See, the goal was to go into the Mexican's house, and I'm just referring to him as the Mexican, no disrespect. I just don't know his name, and, and we're just going to refer to him as that because he was a Mexican guy. The goal was to go in when he wasn't home. She said, she claimed she knew where the money was at. It was going to kick the door in or whatever, grab the money, and be gone. Nobody gets hurt. In and out. Thief in the night. Think about a robbery. Think about crime in general. It rarely goes as planned. Anybody that's listening to me, a robbery, criminal activity, period, rarely goes as planned. This is the night. It's the time to make the move. The girl that set everything up, she's not there. But what she does is she gives everybody the, you know, the details. Okay, this is where he lives. This is where, you know, because she didn't want to be on the scene. Had another female, female friend that was in the, the, the clique, the crew. She was driving. So you got the three dudes that go inside. The whole thing, Big Dave, was, it was contingent upon no one getting hurt. That was the only way that he would agree to do something like this. Nobody can't get hurt. Well, you had one of the individuals, he's like, okay, we're not trying to hurt nobody, but there's no way I'm going in without a gun. Big Dave wanted to use like a toy gun, a prop gun. The other dude's like, nah, man, I ain't trying to use nah because you never know what's going to happen. We may have to find ourselves in a, a situation where we got to shoot ourselves, you know, out of, you know, out of uh, the situation just to leave. No, I'm not going in with no toy gun. It's a discrepancy. They decided to go in with the real gun. But the whole thing, they were told that the Mexican gentleman was not at home. They kick the door in. Boom. When they kick the door in, lo and behold, the Mexican gentleman was sitting on the couch. As one of the individuals that was with Big Dave pull, goes to pull his gun out, the Mexican reaches, the Mexican dude reaches under the uh, pillow and grabs his. He gets the fire, and it's an outright war, it's a shootout. In a little bitty apartment. When it was all said and done. The Mexican gentleman was, was shot. One of the individuals that was with. Big Dave. And his crew. He got grazed. He didn't really. You know. Fortunately for him. He just got grazed. Amongst all the commotion. The. The noise from the gunshots, the screaming. They had to leave. Man, let's get the money, man. Let's get the money. The other two, no, nah, man, let's go. We got to go, man. We got to go. See, Big Dave was a big dude, man. It's not like he was fast. He could, you know, he, he was just a, a larger size uh, individual. They were able to leave the scene for the police, uh, you know, arrive. They look on the news. They see it. The Mexican gentleman, rest in peace, he didn't survive. He didn't survive that that, that gunfire that was exchanged. Nobody said nothing. They had a meeting. Listen, we could be in some deep, hot water. Nobody say nothing. We got away with the situation. Unfortunately, you know, someone lost their life. Do not say a word. That was the agreement. Nobody was to say anything. You got five people. All responsible for the unaliving of this Mexican gentleman. It's only a matter of time before somebody says something to somebody. A couple years passed. 
Although Big Dave still thinks about these things, he thinks about the blood on his hands, he thinks about the fact that you had an innocent individual that was in his house not bothering anybody. Now he's no longer with us. The shame, the guilt, it was mounting up. I think deep down inside he knew it was just a matter of time before he heard that, that knock at the door or them people kicked the door in. He knew they were coming at some point. One of the guys gets caught up selling drugs. Gets caught with a gun. He can't go and do his time. Man, I can tell y'all about a situation, man. I can tell y'all, man, but y'all got to cut me a deal. So he's working with the detectives. He's working with the, the you know, the law, Johnny Law. He tells them about everything, the whole plot. Everything that happened. Well, of course, at that point, police put two and two together. They start picking everybody up. Once they start picking people up, then just what it was. Somehow it all got blamed on Big Dave. He was the mastermind. He was the one that set the entire thing up. For whatever reason, they blamed Big Dave for it. They're going back and forth to court. They got the death penalty on the table. I never quite understood exactly why, because on a death penalty case, typically it has to be like a, you know, you have to plan to uh, uh, unalive someone. The death penalty was on the table. The offer for Big Dave was life without. Then you had the two females, you know, the one that set the whole thing up. She wasn't there. She was a white female. The other female, she was white just as well. And then the other three guys, they were black guys. So it get, the whole thing got switched. It got turned around to where they talked the females into doing it. But in all actuality, it was the females that talked them into doing it. Y'all rock with me. I, I think you all can see where this is going. They all take plea deals. They're going to testify against Big Dave. I believe the one that set the whole thing up got like 10 years. A regular 10 years, meaning that she does 20% of her time and has an opportunity to go home. The other one, she got about the same amount of time. The dudes, they got more time, but nobody was facing more time than Big Dave. Everybody turned on Big Dave. They're offering, uh, initially they weren't even offering a plea deal to Big Dave. He has to go to trial facing the death penalty. He's devastated. He's shook. He's a young man. Now his actions, even though he wasn't the one that actually pulled the trigger, he was there. That's the thing about young people. They don't understand when you're there. That's all that matters. Even if you're not there, they have a, it's called aiding and abetting. So if I tell you, hey man, it's a $10,000 in this house right here. I'm going to just wait outside or I'm not even going to go. Y'all call me. I'm way across town. I don't partake in it other than telling you. You all go in there and get that 10 grand or attempt to get that 10 grand and something happens. Somebody's unalived or guess what? I'm just as responsible as you are. Understand that, young people. And so they're not offering him a plea deal. He's facing the death penalty. He's terrified. His people do whatever they can do to get him an attorney. Lawyer wants sixty, seventy thousand dollars for a case like this. They raise the money, put the house up, do all type of thing. He's not getting out on bond. He's no bond, but at least he can have a, uh, you know, a decent shot, if you will, with the real attorney. The offer goes down at the last minute to life without. He's not trying to take life without parole. After all, he's seeing all the other individuals, you know, the, the co-defendants. He's seeing all his co-defendants getting, you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, which is still a lot of time. But they would still have another opportunity at life. And here it is. He was the last one to uh, agree to it. Now he's the mastermind. Now he's Nino from New Jack City. 
he's not agreeing to life without either. He's going to roll the dice and go to trial. On the day of his trial, the prosecution gives him a blessing. We're going to offer you 35 years. 35 years in which you would have to do 85% of that. Like I said, he's already at this point, he's 23, 24 years old. In the state of Kentucky, when you get a sentence that's 85%, the most time that you can do is 20 years and then you see the parole board. I don't care if you get a 50-year sentence. After you do 20 years, you must see the parole board. His lawyer is trying to break this down and, and explain to him, but Big Dave, he's not comprehending. He's not understanding. Dude, if you go to this box, man, they're going to knock your socks off. Man. I understand 35 years is a lot of time. It's 23, 24. You do 20. You get out in your mid-40s, maybe. Late 40s, early 50s. And you still have an opportunity at life. Who's looking at 45, 50 years old when you're 23 and 24? That seems like an eternity. He doesn't want to take the 35. They're going to proceed on to trial. They bring his mother back. She talks to him. He gets to crying, breaking down. Mom, I didn't do anything. He's still of the mind frame of, I didn't do anything. Mom, I didn't do anything. Mom, I'm not the one that, that pulled the trigger, man. I didn't. Mama can't help you. She can console you. She can let you know that, son. You you got to face this music. I understand you hurt, but this, what about this uh, gentleman's uh, uh, family? What about his kids? What about his loved ones? What about him? Stand up and be a man. You was a man when you went in there, so I love you. You my son, but stand up and be a man. He ends up agreeing to take the 35 years. 20 years to he sees the parole board. If he takes classes and, and stays out of trouble and things of that nature, he could probably kill that whole 35 year, 30, yeah, 35 year sentence out in about 25, 26 years. Maybe earlier. But you're going to do that 20. No way around that. <laughs> he takes the time. And he finds himself in the Kentucky Department of Corrections. He had been in the county jail fighting the case for a good two and a half, three years. So just think about how young this young man was when the crime actually happened. 20, 21 years old. Never even had a shot at life. Never even been with a woman at that point. He's explaining all of these things to me. I feel bad for him. But at the same time, I feel even worse for the individual that was sitting in his home, minding his business, man. What if his kids was there? What if there's a whole lot of things that could have gone, I'm not going to necessarily say wrong, because it did go wrong. It did go left. But just think of his wife or his girlfriend or his mother or other individuals were involved. I told him, I said, bro, you just got to do the time. You got to get in that book and that Bible. And you got to work on not necessarily praying to God that you get out. But that you change your heart and become a better person. Yeah, but Ken's, I'm not even the one that did it, man. We was going in there. Nobody was even supposed to be get hurt. And they talked me into doing that. I understand that, bro, but you already took the time now. You already, So what's done is done. I understand that you venting and, and you, you know, you feel some type of way about it. But you've already taken the plea deal, the 35 years, and you participated in this, this crime. See, he couldn't understand how the white girls got 10 years, but he got a regular 10 years. Well, they do two years and see the parole board, but he has to do a minimum of 20 years when they talked him into it. That's the way that these things work. Then you had the individual that caught the gun in the, in the, in the dope case. 
if it wasn't for him, this whole crime, this whole uh, uh, tragic event wouldn't even be solved. See, when you have co-defendants, they will always have something hanging over your head when a crime was committed. A crime like this, a heinous crime like this. You look at the rapper Lil Durk. For you all that's not familiar with Lil Durk, he's a very successful rapper. He was just arrested. And now they're trying to hit him with the um, murder for hire. Something that happened, you know, a few years ago. A couple of his co-defendants got arrested. Somehow his name came up, then they came and got him. Understand that when you commit a crime, and I'll say this once again, when you commit a crime, it's never going to go away. It's always going to be a possibility. I've seen situations to where 20 years has passed, 25 years, and they come and get you. I was at Green River uh, uh, Prison. I want to say 2013, I believe. It was an individual that had been locked up for 26 years. He was about to go home. Slightly before he went home, the state police paid him a visit questioning him about a double murder allegedly he had gone inside the house with another individual on a robbery they woke up allegedly he beat the couple an older you know elderly couple with a hammer and took both of their lives they got away with it Allegedly. And 26 years later, actually it was longer than 26 years because he had been locked up 26 years on a totally other unrelated, you know, uh, crime. That crime had taken place maybe four years prior. State police came, questioned him, came back and questioned him. On the day that they let him out, and he wasn't surprised, on the day that they let him out, they were waiting on him outside. Put your hands behind your back. You've been charged with a double homicide. Said the individual's name, the couple's name. So he walks out of the penitentiary straight to the county jail. So then he had to fight that case. I don't even know what ultimately happened because I never seen the gentleman ever again. Anything that you do, there will be a price to pay for it. And so when you take this, this rapper, Young Dirk, like I said, he's very, very successful. Now he's sitting in the county jail right now with no bond. He got to the point of where he was trying to change, you know, clean his life up, uh, change his image. You know, he was doing community service. His dad had done like 30 years in, in prison. So his dad came home and really was able to get a hold of him. And, and you know, because little Dirk's from Chicago, man, you know, and he goes down in, in Chirac. Shout out to uh, Chi-Town, Miss Deborah. It really goes down in Chi-Town. It goes down in a lot of other places. It goes down everywhere. But he was trying to talk to kids and, like I said, community service and, and clean his act up. But the thing is, the alleged crime took place and it was already done. I'm not saying that he's guilty of it. I'm not saying he's not guilty. I don't know. You just never know. You never know when that bullet is going to come back to bite you. P. Diddy, another example. All the years that he got away with doing the dirt that he did. So we can't get you on the on the Tupac murder. We can't get you with the Biggie Smalls murder. We can't get you on the Kim Porter murder. We can't get you on these things. So we're going to hit you with this, the sex traffic. We're going to hit you with, with we're going to get you somehow, some way. And they're going to do their best to make sure that P. Diddy never gets out again. And if he does, he's going to be an old man. If it can happen to P. Diddy, who's a billionaire. If it can happen to R. Kelly, who's a multimillionaire at one point. 
If it can happen to Bill Cosby, who's close to being a billionaire, America's dad. If it can happen to Young Thug, very successful rapper out of Atlanta. If it can happen to Little Dirt, we just discussed him. And a whole slew of others. Young Dolph situation, rapper out of Memphis that, that was tragically uh, murdered, broad daylight. The individuals that was responsible for unaliving him, I believe both got life sentences. One of the individuals that actually was there told on the other individual, got on the stands and testified against him. Got him a life sentence. And best believe they're not done looking into that case either. See, these feds, man, they 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 hitting everybody with these RICO uh, cases. So when you're running around here trying to be a rapper and you think that you, and that's cool if that's what you want to do, understand that it's dangerous. It's a dangerous gig. Because, see, when you blow up, guess what? You got to have some people that are around you that's going to protect you. Because you're going to have a whole lot of haters coming at you. <laughs> so you got to have shooters around you. Then if you done came from the streets, you can't just get rich in your mind. This is how you think. I can't just get rich and leave my people. So now you bring an entourage. You got 15, 20 people around you. But you're responsible for all of those individuals. So if something jumps off, even if you're not the one that did it, guess what? You have the big name. You have the money. You have the, the notoriety. They're coming after you. All the money that a lot of these guys have made, the feds are going to, um, they're going to take it. They're going to say that you funded your criminal enterprise. They don't even refer to Young Thug uh, uh, YSL. They don't refer to it as YSL record label. They refer to it as, when I say they, the government, the feds, YSL street gang. So all the money that was generated from, you know, the, the record sales and, and, and the hard work that you put in, guess what? They're going to say you use that to fund this, this gang. To fund your street ties and, and street uh, dealings and ordeals, if you will, and seize your assets. Y'all really ready? You ready for that? Y'all got these Glocks, y'all got these switches, y'all got these, and y'all out here doing these things. And when I say y'all, I'm not speaking about everybody. I'm only speaking about the individuals that are doing it. You're gunning people down in broad daylight, hitting innocent people, mothers, kids, and it doesn't make a difference at this point. And all you're gonna say, all you're gonna say afterwards is, man, it wasn't meant for them. Y'all better take heed, man. And so, basically, the way that I'm speaking with you all is, is pretty much how I talk to Big Dave. After he, you know, he got it all out, pause. But he was able to, you know, kind of get some things, you know, off his chest. Get the man up, big boy. Like your mother told you, man, you got to do this time, man. Sitting around crying about it ain't going to get it. I'm sure that his family cries every night, man. Pray, get on your knees and pray for forgiveness. And rock with me. At this point, I want to say this has been... Been about 10 years. Just guessing. Big Dave, about 10 years. He already had a couple years in, in the county jail, whatever. So, Big Dave is going to get an opportunity, as I've already mentioned, to see the streets again. I just hope that he's really, really gotten his mind right and become focused. See, the penitentiary is full of Big Dave's difference is they didn't have an opportunity to get 35 years they got life life without parole 70 80 years to where the parole board can continue to play with them come back and see us in 10 years 
then you do the 10 years after already doing 20. Okay, come back and see us in, in, in two years. You think you're getting closer. All right, come back and see us in another uh, five years. Penitentiary's full of dudes right now. 22, 23 years old, 25. I've been there. Dudes is walking around wishing that they had an opportunity to go back and change the hands of time and, and, and not do what they did to be out there with their family. Prison is a dangerous, lonely uh, place with just tension in the air and it can jump, it can pop off at any given time. You put 1,500 uh, miserable people miserable people around each other what do you think the results is going to be no the number one thing in prison that they understand the number one thing that's understood in prison is violence so i can talk you to death tell you what i'm gonna do and if you do this again if you do that again and but if you that's why they call it a demonstration it's another thing I've seen several times. I've told you all about it in prior videos. Getting a fight with somebody, you don't just, you know, beat them up and it's over with and, and help them up and shake hands afterwards. No, man, you try to stomp they, the brakes off of them, beat the brakes. Why? Because it's a demonstration. You want to show people that this is what's going to happen to you if you run up on me. I done seen dudes knocked out on their feet. Up against the wall. What well, kids, how can you be knocked out on your feet? I mean, you can. I've seen it. Eventually, you're going to hit the ground. And dude just beating them. Boom. 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 Just beating them. Flush. Just flush. Flush punches. Hitting flesh. Then they get down on the ground. They finally fall to the ground. Hit their head on the ground. When they fall. You got them black state boots on that they give you in prison. And Bob Barkers, that's what they call them in Kentucky. And you just stomp them. Stomp them until the guards come. Stomp them, stomp them until you forget. Or not forget, but... So let's rewind that, because I don't like the way that sounds. We're going to do the manual rewind. You stomp them until you get tired. Oftentimes in prison, nobody's going to break up a fight. Now, you got somebody that's really, really close to you. Come on, bro. So with man. He's had enough. But if you don't know that person, man, you better not break up no fight. One of these weirdos jumped in my comments. Uh, I believe it was today. And I was telling a story about how an individual that I knew, once I got to prison, he was already turned out. He's getting in the shower with an individual every night. He's sitting on this individual's bed every day. He done shaved his face. I done gave him all the warnings before he went because he got to prison a couple months before I did. I don't even know if it was a couple months, maybe about a month before I did. And so the individual that jumped in my comments was like, well, if you've seen all of this going on, why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you intervene? Why didn't you? It's not the way that it works in prison, man. You mind your business. He didn't look as though he was, you know, trying to fight, trying to fight it. So if you're not going to fight for yourself, who I look like taking up for you? I'm trying to get back home to my family just as well. Now, let's not get it misconstrued. If he came to me and said, hey, bro, these dudes are doing that and, and they won't stop, man. And I'm tired of it. And I'm. Then, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be. But when I've initially tried to speak with him and talk to him about it, he spoke and kept it moving. That's one of the cardinal sins in prison, man. Obviously, I've said you don't gamble, you don't borrow, you definitely don't steal, you don't snitch. These are cardinal sins, man, that you could lose, get your, not beyond getting your wig split, you can lose your life over. 
but you don't come between a man and his other man in prison, his boy in prison. I know it sounds, it's not the most, uh, it's kind of gross. But that's what it is. They take it very, very serious in prison. Very serious. For the individuals that partake in that. Most people don't participate in that. You got certain people that say, oh man, dudes in jail, man, they do this, they do that, man. You see it, but it's on a small scale. That's just keeping it as 100 as I possibly can keep it. But however, the individuals that are participating in that, you better not jump in, in, in between. Hey, man, you need to leave little buddy alone, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you right. Now, guess what? Them lions, tigers, bears, gorillas, goons, hyenas, they coming for you. A lot of people think that booty bandits is, is, is just soft and they, man, these dudes be gorillas, man, sometimes, oftentimes. That's why they get away with, with bullying and, and just kind of taking. They used to taking what they want. Respect it on the yard. They're going to weight pal, throw up 400 pounds, deadlift five, 600 pounds, squat 500 pounds. And people know that they're a bandit, but they're respected on the yard. Why? Because they're more so feared on the yard. Yeah, people's talking behind their back. Hey, man. You know what I'm saying? Big dude, man, he be messing with them boys. He be... But they're not going to say it to his face. Dude's a gorilla. Been locked up 15 years. Been working out every day. Six days a week, rather. 15 years. Look like he, he stepped straight out of a, a, a magazine. Muscles everywhere. And they carry them things. Blade Pusher. Shout out to Dante from the Dante Show Network. The original Blade Pusher. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do, brother? When the 24-inch pythons come for you. What are you going to do? What prison is about, man. Lions, tigers, and birds. You youngsters, man, hopefully you get a hold of this. Hopefully you all share this video and let some of these youngsters see. It's, it's not a game, man. You can't take no guns in there with you. It's ain't TV. You ain't just walking around with, with uh, you know, ice picks on you like that. This is not TV. This is real life reality. And you will lose your life. Or your manhood, which is essentially losing your life in prison, despite who you are. Especially once you get into those federal systems. Because if you're in the state, you catch a state case, then you're going to be in the state. You're going to be within your state. But if you catch a fed case, I'm in Kentucky, man. I may be end up in Oklahoma, Kansas. Missouri, California, New York. No telling where I'll end up at. I'm not going to have a crew or a clique down there. Maryland or somewhere. I don't know nobody down here. You all Google uh, Big Sandy. Now you got Little Sandy in Kentucky. That's a state pen. But Google Big Sandy uh, USP. Google it. And I implore you all to do some research on it. It's not going to take you that long. Big Sandy USP violence. At one point, it was the most violent prison in the U.S. Dudes was getting unalived every day. Y'all ready for that? Y'all tough out here on the streets. You got these glide. You got these switches. You Are you ready for that? Are you ready? Are you ready, B? How they say in New York? You ready, son? Shout out to New York. Got these beautiful women running around out here. You got kids. You blessed to still have your mother, your father, your family, your grandmother. You can go to school. You can be anything that you want to be out here, man. But y'all want to be gangsters in the street. They got a place for you. 
24 hours, seven days a week, revolving doors. We never close, baby. And we just sit back and wait on y'all to tell on yourselves on the internet and in these videos. Real Kens TV. Hopefully you like the video. Feel free to comment. Definitely share. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed. Be sure to hit that post notification. So anytime I bring you this action and this, this heat, guess what? You're amongst the first to receive. People are not getting the notifications of my videos. Fret not. Just check the channel every day. Every day I'm typically dropping. If I miss a day, you know, it's not going to be multiple days that I miss. Been a little down in the dumps about my Cowboys, but hey, it's all good. And especially when I, I got a notification yesterday and, uh, and the boy Jay Williams is on, man. Respectfully. Jay Williams is back in the building. Looking forward to his videos. Um, shout out to Jay Williams. Let's live life, man. You know what I mean? He's partly the reason why I'm here. He's the main reason why I'm here. Watching his channel encouraged me to uh, start my own channel, man. Happy times for him. Was able to, you know, go in there, handle his business, do his time like a man, get it out of the way. And here it is, back home with his family for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. And not just those uh, particular days, just in general. His son, little Bella, his wife, he's back home, man. Real Kids TV, man.